Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Jeremy Petrovich of Wiley's Current Protocols. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this panel discussion on operating an imaging core facility during a pandemic, sponsored by Nikon Instruments. Operating an image core facility during a pandemic with social distancing, concerns over surface and air transmission of the virus are at the forefront of many users' minds and pose rather unique challenges to those operating those facilities. We are joined today by a panel of core facility experts to discuss the challenges facing them and how they're adapting to this new research landscape. With us today is Dr. Josh Rappaport, the Executive Director of Research Infrastructure at Boston College, located in Boston, Massachusetts in the United States. Welcome, Josh. Thank you very much. We also have Dr. Julia Fernandez Rodriguez, the head of the Center for Cellular Imaging and the Core Facility Center for Cellular Imaging at Chogranska Academy at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. Thank you for joining us, Julia. Thank you. Next is Dr. Jennifer Waters, director of the Nikon Imaging Center at Harvard Medical School and Chen Zuckerberg Imaging Scientist at the Harvard Medical School in Boston, Mass, as well in the United States. Hello, Jennifer. Welcome. Hi. Thanks for having me. Our final panelist is Dr. Sebastian Monk, head of the VIB Bioimaging Corps and the Center for Brain and Disease Research at KU Leuven in Belgium. Thank you very much for joining us today, Sebastian. It's good to be part of it. Thanks. So let's start with our first topic for discussion. Um, Josh, I'm going to direct this to you to start. So as kind of a background for the discussion, and we'll, and we'll go around the panel, could you just briefly discuss what the current status of your facility is and the trajectory for operations in your institute and facility since mid-March? Sure, happy to do it. Um, so I'll, I'll expand a little bit because I'm... Um, I'm sort of responsible for oversight of the whole core facility program here. So I am a microscopist. I used to run an icon imaging center myself at Northwestern, but my position at Boston College is uh, looking after the whole uh, core facility program. And so um, basically uh, our current status is we are in what we're referring to as the ramp up phase. So obviously things aren't back to normal, whatever normal might become, but um, we uh, basically, uh, largely followed uh, the governor of Massachusetts sort of timelines. So uh, going back uh, the end of March, things sort of ramped down and uh, we didn't really have uh, COVID specific research projects. We also aren't, don't have a medical school. So our core facilities in particular, the microscopy core facilities were um, uh, pretty much shut except for essential maintenance functions until a few weeks ago. So after May 25th, uh, labs in the uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts could start opening up again. So it's really only been a couple of weeks that people have been coming back, making sure the instruments work, running QC, and then now uh, recently uh, welcoming the researchers back in. Great, thank you. Uh, Julia, why don't we have you go next? In a labor institute, well, Sweden might be an exception compared to the other countries and uh, my colleagues. Of course, I'm representing here the microscopy facility, but we also have proteomics, mass spectrometry, bioinformatics. And we have been active the whole time. We have not closed the facility. Uh, our staff is, have been working most of the time or all the time at the facility. Uh, except, except some sections in the beginning that we have some people to reduce the number of uh, staff they were working in home by remote and the users equally we have uh, we have, have use all the time using our instruments of course with restrictions on terms of social distancing I have only one user per per microscope and of course, cleaning hands, using gloves and things like that. But we have not closed the facilities. Uh, the only thing, because this is a university facility, there have been difference compared to uh, all the, the, the last years, is that the students, the, this is a medical faculty, the Salgrensk Academy, the students uh, was home. All of them have been done online, remote uh, teaching. And that's the only difference in the faculty that is emptying the corridors. But scientists as well have a uh, work. As I say, we have not have a, a stop. It's just only putting restrictions in the number of people that have to be at the rooms or in the corridors of the facility. And of course, try to keep the social distance. And until um, uh, the only thing we actually reduce 
it was in the beginning the training face to face uh, because of the social distance that we were not able to keep that. Uh, we asked the vice chancellor and the dean because obviously being a facility where we're training and educated, if we don't get new users, it will be a, it will be a, a problem in the long term. And then we have of course um, got the yes from the dean to have faced to have the training again. But uh, we have uh, reduced the time that we have to be with, this, with the user at the, at the microscope. Mm -hmm. Most of the training is actually due by remote right now. We do remote training and we keep to the minimum the face-to-face -face, uh, training. Of course, we have to show the hardware. We have to show how to switch on the microscope and off. And when we do that, we need to wear masks and use gloves to, to, to the microscope. But we don't have to, to do, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I don't know, the, 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 I think the future or the time will tell us if Sweden have followed the best way or the worst way. Uh, we, we have not have to do, I mean, we are not exactly in the face that the Josh or probably many of the, my other colleagues ask, as you say, I'm in my office and not at home. And it has been like that actually all this time. We have not stopped. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sebastian, why don't we go on to you? Yeah, I think we are somewhere in between. We have been, we had a full lockdown, but only for relatively short. Um, from there on, we went on with some minimal presence here, which meant that I was basically coming in for a few hours a day. We had some critical work that was still continuing. Also, COVID-related search was continuing. Um, the situation here was actually quite diverse, also between different uh, neighboring and related universities. Our institute is uh, following some Howard Hughes Medical School model, so we know from our colleagues how it went at, at the other places. Um, practically, we went over from some um, limited uh, presence here of 30% of the people to what is current and working in shifts to what is now 50% uh, of people on the work floor and meaning uh, at this time point basically resuming more or less all activities. We're still reduced, but we can, I can clearly say like we, we have uh, seen all faces and we have seen how it is uh, when it's all nice and quiet and how it is when um, now people coming back and some are very scared and uh, and are cautious, uh, while others uh, try to catch up uh, the time that uh, they couldn't do research and, and trying to uh, do more than before. And this is even one of the, the, I would say, the challenges that we're currently facing is dealing with that uh, kind of diversity at this moment. Um, we uh, have uh, little official requirements with, with I mean, obviously uh, for PPE, um, there is some requirements generally with labs and so on. There is no uh, restrictions with mouth masks. It's encouraged and we have been provided with some uh, cloth masks, but no um, um, really strict uh, rules on that. If you can keep the distance, it will still be fine. Um, it's asked though to, to use them if you can't uh, keep the distance. We don't do trainings at this moment. I think that's actually also some of the still things that are going on. Um, it's not that we are back at some new normal. Also, we are waiting for the second wave, I think. Um, but practically, um, having the ups and downs of, of people here um, is something that is kind of a, um, an experience, I would say. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer. Yeah, so Harvard Medical School sounds like we might have been the most conservative of the group here. Um, research operations ramped down in uh, middle of March, and um, there were the only projects that were allowed to continue on campus were uh, projects that were approved by all of the preclinical department chairs and the dean, um, and those were primary, primarily COVID-related projects. So there were two such projects that were being worked on in the core facility. Um, so just those two microscopes remained open for the duration of the project. Um, my staff and I have been working from home um, since then primarily. And we began the ramp up phase um, on June 8th. 
So that was a period of time where the core facilities and the labs were to prepare the um, lab space for the next phase, which we're in now, um, which is reduced capacity um, on campus. So in the labs, that means you know things like one person per bay, so people are working in shifts. So the amount of research going on on campus is reduced now. Um, the core is completely open. We prepped, we spent about seven days preparing the core, um, which involved moving some microscopes to make sure that there was enough distance between them, um, recording videos on how to disinfect the microscopes. And um, I, I've done some Zoom uh, safety training for the users as well. All right, thank you. So for the next point of discussion, I'll direct towards Julia to have her start. Um, what do you view as being the largest challenge currently to operating uh, your facility? And how have you been able to adjust and meet the expectation and the needs of your users? Sorry, I think I lost you in part of the question. Could you repeat it again? Oh, oh that's fine. So uh, currently, what do you view as being the largest challenge to operating your facility? And how have you been able to try to adjust to that challenge and meet the needs of your users? Okay. Yes, thank you. Um, I think uh, having mainly the training, as I said before, because the users could actually work at the facility. And uh, for us in Sweden, because as our prime minister say, we have to keep the social distance. We have to be less than 50 people in a group. And we have to keep like two meters in between. And then that's a problem because our microscope rooms, as I think maybe except uh, some sections that they are lucky and they have big rooms, there are not big rooms. That means that it's very difficult to keep the, the work in the, the, the distance in between. Uh, and then, of course, if we have to we, we have to reduce the number of uses before many people was coming two or three sitting there discussing, you know, the researchers. And we have to really do that. And, and it was not always understanding by everybody. I have to have discussions with PIs and, and this, tell them, explain them why we have to do in that way. They say, oh, but they share in the same office normally. And I have to say, yes, but this is not the same when they're sitting here. And sometimes they have to go in and out the, um, the, the room. And then if I actually left as usual as before, it will be crowded in the corridor of the facility. Then that's have been one problem. And of course, the education, when we have to do the courses, uh, we have to initially cancel a, a PhD course that we have because the number of people was bigger and we were not allowed to actually do it that way and only do by remote because at that moment everything happened so fast we were not prepared for do the online teaching that we will do in October. We have to cancel the one in spring and we will do in October. And because we knew that the second course we have in image analysis, we already have planned to do completely online, even if it might be that in October we will be in September, we will be able to do. And I think it have been mainly the education you know, or the, tra the, the training, uh, uh, explain the people they have to keep the social distance. Even if we will not have restrictions to work and we can be here in Sweden, and we have to still keep the distance. And I think that was uh, the main uh, problem to people understand that now they cannot come two or three students together with a person that is going to look at the microscope. Uh, for the rest, we have not had the challenge and problems so far. We, we have been very lucky, I have to say. We are seven people plus meet eight and everybody have been healthy and without problem. And we know that some users or in the group, maybe not the user itself, but the group have had positive cases, but the people have worked really cautious and, and they have been really ca taking care that if they feel up, <laughs> they get home and they, they don't bother. I mean, in the beginning of spring, we have all the allergies you can imagine and people, you didn't know what it was. And then really, they, they really, people was really, really careful and they didn't come to the facility. They actually felt that they might be, they knew as well that they are sick and we become sick. There is no facility where they were very careful on that. And we were happy because of that. There is not other big challenge that we actually have or face. Thank you. 
Uh, Sebastian, how about for your facility? Um, I, I thought to even say it in a bit more abstract way, because I mean, obviously the first concern, if something like this happens, uh, like, you know, it, it's a threat. And the first concern is the, the safety of my staff, I would argue. Um, and that's also the biggest challenge because uh, at the time that this came up, we basically had very little information. One of my staff is highly pregnant. So what do you do in this kind of situation? This is something where I think uh, it's our responsibility to literally take care that uh, we, we create an environment where everyone is, uh, you know, kept safe the most. Uh, I think second concern is also the, the, the uh, safety of the users because um, um, they, of course, are uh, in charge of themselves. But I mean, we also need to create the environment where they can um, follow their own needs for their own safety. Um, and I think on, on, on a third uh, level, uh, I think since most of our uh, mission is to, to make uh, actually uh, best science happening, is that we manage the expectations of our users and also our, our peers and, and those in our organizations that now uh, are asking themselves also how uh, are we continue to operate. And um, uh, I think at my, my least concern, but it's obviously also a concern, is also a bit the financial liquidity because um, we all um, have likely made uh, less user fees collected during this period. So I think shifting some of the investments or uh, operations to, to different times uh, now is, I guess, what, what we all uh, partially are need to agree on. And there, making the connection between managing the expectations and the uh, financial turnaround is, you know, an, an factual challenge. Where I would argue uh, safety is, is obviously the priority. All right, thank you. Uh, Jennifer, how is your facility been dealing with? Um, I'm actually feeling pretty positive about things right now. Um, the ramp up was very stressful. That was that was hard. There was a lot of decisions that needed to be made, and um, some of the decisions we made beforehand. Once we got into the space and started doing it, we realized we had to, you know, rethink. Um, and one of the most stressful parts of that process probably was, um, as Sebastian said, worrying about the health of the staff, um, and also, you know, worrying about the the users who were nervous about the core facility. I think that the users, you know, maybe are a little more comfortable in their lab where they know everybody and they're planning together how to handle things. Um, but in the core, the, the users are relying on us um, mm -hmm. to set the rules, make sure people enforce the rules. Um, so, you know, that, that responsibility we took very seriously and, and so that was stressful. But I think we're in a really good place now. Um, and, and I want to point out, I, there, there's been some positive things as well in this experience. Um, we have started a remote education program, which I'm not sure that we would have gone in that direction um, were it not for all of this. But um, Anna Jost from my group, she's our um, Associate Director for Imaging Education, and she's done an amazing job putting together a lecture series and um, even some, you know, hands-on exercises that the students can do. So that's been a positive. Great, thank you. Josh, how about your So yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll speak from a little bit more of a sort of programmatic overall point of view. Um, I can tell you that the most stressful time for me really was back in sort of mid-March because everything was changing so fast and I felt like, you know, the second that we got a handle on, on advice and guidance and stuff like that, the situation would change drastically. And I always felt like I was scrambling and I, I'm, I'm very, um, uh, I'm in very constant communication with a network of core facility professionals across the world, but especially across the U.S., and just seeing what was going on with all of them and trying to sort of gauge what was happening in a very, you know, rapidly changing, unpredictable situation. That was definitely the most stressful for me. Um, the uh, ramp up. Um, actually, because I think one of the things was that the, as I mentioned, the governor of Massachusetts had published this date, um, you know, May 25th uh, was when research labs could start going back. We, you know, we sort of had this goalpost and things in Massachusetts were really uh, bad for a, a long while, but luckily things have been on a really good trajectory for, you know, several weeks here. And so, um, 
you know, we were able to sort of um, forecast out and make plans and and really get together the stakeholders from environmental health and safety to facilities to the department chairs that, you know, at every level. Um, so I work for the vice provost for research and sort of we co coordinated this process and, and we were able to then, you know, get that with series of different like sort of phases of guidance and then down to the individual cores. And so Brett Judson is the manager of light microscopy and electron microscopy here. And so each of the cores, um, I made a template for sort of ramp up plans and then each of the cores, uh, core heads worked on those and Brett and I worked on his back and forth together. And then those were sent out to all the faculty that use those cores. And there was sort of, again, a sort of feedback process and we did walkthroughs. And as I mentioned, there was this sort of setup phase, you know, like Jennifer was saying, she did that as well. You had this sort of phase where people could go in, set things up, make sure everything works, move stuff around, put up signs. And then, you know, we did sort of walkthroughs and 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 so actually you know so far so good and the past couple of weeks have not been nearly as stressful for me and I think for Brett and the other core heads as were that ramp down phase when the faculty was saying wait what's happening you know are we shutting down you know Harvard shut down a week ago what's happening with us you know that kind of stuff was super duper stressful so so far so good I mean I have to say though I mean I think everyone's aware of the news you know there are certain parts of America right now that are just dire and whether that's going to continue, whether that's going to spread, whether there's going to be a rebound, um, however you want to couch that in terminology, you know, that's sort of this gnawing stress that I have at this point. But so far, so good. We're sort of gradually um, um, getting our stride, I think. Great. Thank you. So I'd actually like to return to an earlier point that was made by both Jennifer and Julia uh, concerning things such as um, remote, you know, kind of remote training for the use of the microscopes and how to do things like image analysis. So actually, Jennifer, why don't we start with you? Can you just kind of elaborate a little bit about what that process is looking like? Are you, and also are you getting support from these microscope vendors in terms of like temporary software licenses for image analysis? Uh, or, you know, or like lab, you know, is the university able to provide workstations for users that you can loan out, things like that? <laughs> Yeah, so um, yeah, just, just to be clear, the remote education program that we've set up is, is um, sort of the current version of our workshop courses. So these are, um, you know, microscopy education in general. It's not training on the microscopes. Like the others, we're currently not training users. Um, we hope that if things continue to go well in Massachusetts, um, that we'll be able to do that within uh, weeks. Um, but yeah, so we have um, our image analysis computers set up for remote access. A lot of the analysis that, that people are doing, um, you know, you, you need a pretty hefty computer. So, so we have remote access set up and that's been working well. Um, Nikon is one of the companies that generously offered uh, remote licenses for their software. So our users had taken advantage of that and been able to load it on their computers. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, for us, the idea of remote training on a microscope is not terribly appealing. I think that um, perhaps when we begin training again, there may be some component that is remote, you know, reviewing the software and such. Um, but, you know, Julia mentioned this, there's just a hands-on component that that is really necessary. So, um, we, we are gonna wait until we can, um, we're instructed that we can uh, let up on the social distancing guidelines before we start training again. Thank you. Uh, Sebastian, um, what kind of efforts are, uh, are happening at BIB in terms of user support, remote access, uh, things along those lines? Um, we have been quite happy that we had some great uh, IT support so we could um, pretty quickly move from uh, workstations that were booked and used quite heavily to a remote scenario. I think we, without that pandemic, um, that would not have happened at all. I think, um, I mean, there were some minor hiccups for that, but at the end of the day, I'm, I'm very content how this actually worked. Uh, we have 
moved all our people that do actually image analysis also to only work remotely to keep uh, them out of there from the workflow basically and then keep them at a distance and uh, we it quite yeah we, we were able to shift uh, most of that to uh, a remote setting and um, we have been quite happy with uh, the fact that we have been overall quite well supported by companies for also um, um, other uh, image analysis units. There was Nikon obviously as well, but there is also um, Imaris and Arrivis provided us with some support for getting licenses and, and things that normally would be requiring some, some local hardware key to move that actually into uh, being able to have them accessing, being accessed uh, remotely and, and run through remote desktops and related solutions. I think in a way uh, for the image analysis, um, our field has been waiting actually to, to do that a bit more remotely and it, it leans itself a bit to it. I think um, we can support people quite okay overall. I think it takes more time. I mean, it's, it's always easier with, when you can point to things and, and literally the hands-on training on a microscope where you say, now nah, you push this button, is the stuff that we can't do and which if you try to do is now taking enormous lot of time because you need to basically explain and, 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 and uh, convey an, an, an experience of, of how you do and handle things, which is un impossible. For analysis, that works way better, and the virtualization of analysis stations is, is something that can be handled. I mean, it's not totally trivial, and I think uh, IT support here is also uh, utmostly critical, because without them, we, we couldn't have moved that quickly and done that. So um, I think that is uh, a kind of uh, important message that here I think different uh, service facilities in that sense need to also here shake hands and then work out solutions together and I think we will see more of that even for the future training because um, um, getting that immediate or not uh, distant training as as close together and as an you know experience as if you were close or next by to someone is something that we still need to work out the best solution I know people having put webcams and stuff into microscopy rooms that can help a bit, but it's not really doing it. And then also calling in in multiple sessions in parallel on the phone and on the screen and running the remote desktop in parallel uh, can work. It's challenging. It's taking more time. I think that's a bit of a lesson also that, that we learned. Uh, a lot of things are now really uh, also a bit slower down as compared to how we used them to do them before. Thank you. Um, Julia, could you please, uh, do you have any thoughts to add to that? Okay, I have to say that we have really positive answer from the users related to the remote training. We have remote desktop, but we can actually do virtual if we want. Uh, even so that our microscope computers are sitting in a sensitive environment because we have a special wire uh, firewalls to protect them. Uh, the IT department have make a nice tunnel that we can open every time that we have to remotely train the users. Um, we have to say that we have done so far five trainings where people have different uh, expertise from some people that have some new something for people that they didn't. And one of the things that to have, of course, we made recommendations to them in terms of using headsets and to try to use a good screen, big screen, we test things before. Um, I have to say that the first training is remote, uh, purely remote, and they go through the program of the microscope. In this case, it's size microscopes. And they are more focused because once you have them in the room, they start looking around and chatting with you. Where in this case, it's really, really focused on the, on the, um, on the program. And um, when they come, because we say, oof, let's see what happened now when we have the, when we go to the face to face and, but it actually, they have cut quite a lot. Uh, we, if we compare, because we are comparing now uh, with the actual face to face training that we have before, and we, we, we actually really consider maybe to keep anyway, even if the pandemic go down and we don't have a second or third wave, uh, to actually do that and definitely for the education purpose is going to be wonderful. 
I think my talented staff have done a great job in terms of how uh, you don't have an arrow go through all the screen and to move it in a special way. There is some small programs that you can adapt it to the computer that allow you to see a circle and then you know that the user know where they have to see instead that is not completely diffused and confused in that. It say, actually, we, we have uh, have a, really, a very positive answer so far. So far, sorry. We asked, the, of course, we have a little feedback from the users when we finish and asking them what had been good, what they think it was not good. The challenging part it was because when we training the users, obviously we do some basic training in, of course, uh, basis in microscopy. We have to explain what is resolution and what is uh, uh, why you use this objective instead to use that objective. Uh, and we have created also some kind of uh, tutorials that it pop up uh, once we ask. And right now we actually ask more questions to the user. If you want to do this, do you know which uh, and you know what is resolution or if, if you use this my, the objective or you choose this objective, which is, uh, I mean, we are actually the ones investigating and once they don't answer because they don't know, is when we actually bring the tutorials and helping them with that. As we have done before, they were drawing with hand when you're sitting face to face. Uh, we, we have so far, as I say, five, there was one more, two more next week. And if I see the feedback we get, is actually quite positive. That means that we will consider seriously to do on image analysis and remote training. We have not done that, but uh, our tra our image analysis is done already by remote because our powerful server is always working in remote. That means uh, not for the for the workstations, but for the the image analysis. It's all done by remote. If the users need to do something, we are already interacting remotely even before uh, that we got into the pandemic. That means that actually we are really considering uh, moving to at least part of the training phase uh, uh, training by remote. And the, the users have been much more focused on, on the program than when they sitting with us at the, at the facility. This is actually the experience we have so far. Great, thank you. Uh, Josh, could you please? Uh... Yeah, I mean, the, I think the situation, it's very similar to what, what, what we've heard. So, I mean, if you break it out, there's the sort of training piece, there's the operation, and then there's the analysis. And uh, like most people, there's no in-person face-to-face training going on. Um, I think it's a, a time of year when there aren't a lot of new grad students coming and things like that. So, you know, summer is usually a good time for um, the most experienced researchers to sort of maximize their access, at least here. So um, that's sort of not explicitly, but I think that having the most experienced people um, focusing on their most critical experiments is a way of, of sort of staving off too much need for uh, support. And the support that's offered, for example, during operations uh, will be, you know, either remote or so the way that our facility is set up, the, the the manager's office is sort of facing each, there, there are three or four different microscope rooms and basically his office is sort of in the middle of them. And so the the, the one way I think that it, it, it's going is someone will say, oh, I can't find focus or oh, the laser isn't firing. And then they'll step out of the room and he'll step into the room kind of a thing. Um, so to avoid that sort of face-to-face -face contact again, but have that at the minute. So he's, he's coming in, you know, he He's supporting during regular work hours, um, but I think it's primarily going to be the more expert users doing using the instruments they're used to using. That doesn't mean they won't have problem, but um, and then things like consultations and you know questions and answers will be all be done remotely or, or with you know video conferencing. Um, and then with the analysis, um, generally speaking, there isn't a, a, a ton of in facility analysis going on here. It's not kind of the model people are analyzing their data back in their own labs. Um, 
but we've explored um, all these kinds. Of, you know, uh, Brett and I have talked about all of this, and I've talked with other colleagues about this. You know, all everything from as we, we've heard, you know, desktop sharing to remote instances and all this kind of thing. Um, so, you know, there are lots and lots of options out there. And, and from what I've heard, um, many vendors have been really supportive um, in, in in all those areas. And I think training. One thing that I haven't heard a lot about, but I've asked about a little bit, is sort of uh, training emulators. You know, whether you can have uh, set because I know, um, I know, for example, with with Nikon, the support people can themselves, you know, configure an instance of elements with uh, the Nikon software with a con specific configuration, a specific setup of a microscope to try to see what you're seeing or, or, or reproduce some kind of error if there's, you know, a communication error or something. And I haven't heard a lot about different vendors being able to provide that, but that is a pretty uh, specialized tool, I think. Great, thank you. So, kind of turning towards, kind of an eye toward the future in terms of you know for those who are opening up or those who are still or have not closed and just moving forward. I mean, really, like, what do you see your core looking like? So, kind of like, I guess the first thought would be um, for users that are coming in: Are you going to require them to register in advance for a for time slots? Like, you know, somebody just can't pop into the facility. And people who are coming in, are they going to re be required to wear things uh, like personal protective equipment, you know, uh, gloves, masks, things like that, where they might not have be have before? Um, Sebastian, why don't you, if you could start with that, please? Yeah. Uh, I'm happy to do so. Um, the the um, typically we have not been in the past uh, super enforcing uh, rules that the university environment has for our uh, microscopy environments. Typically, it's lab spaces, so it would mean in our environment that you would have to wear a lab coat and these kind of things. That means now, uh, with the current situation, we have to follow this way more strictly. Um, it also means that um, we try to enforce it, and we try to uh, also um, provide a more protective things, like uh, we create our own hand rub, uh, and, and these kind of things so that they are present on the table so that people can disinfect their hands basically at any time. Um, I think one, one item which, which likely is discussed and, and, and is, is, you know, even seem partially controversial is what do you do with gloves? I think we moved from a situation where uh, we all didn't want to have people wearing gloves at, at instruments because who knows what's on these gloves to a situation where everyone could potentially be infectious and we don't want to have that stuff on uh, keyboards and so on. So um, in our place, likewise, um, people are wearing gloves. Um, practically, um, <clears throat> uh, and root of infection is also the eyepieces with the microscopes. So we have been using um, what, what some um, societies have been recommending also uh, cling tape and we've been providing that and have been providing that to cover eyepieces so that you have a one-term use protective environment because I think it doesn't help a lot trying to use safety goggles on front of glasses and then trying to look through eyepieces is not very efficient. But I think we, we, we indeed uh, have a uh, situation where we have now to take way more care of that um, and where we see that uh, um, this also will not uh, go away that quickly because, um, I mean, once you have these concerns and uh, you have to worry that you, you're transmitting things, whether this is now in this current pandemic or even in the next uh, flu wave next spring, uh, I think uh, people are now uh, more uh, sensitive to that issue. And I think we need to also make sure that uh, we create that safe environment for the users, for the, for the staff so that they don't get exposed to that kind of stuff. So I think we will see way more protective environment also in, in just very regular uh, um, microscopy rooms. And uh, yes, I see. I think we see a shift in, in paradigm for, for glove use. Uh, personally, I have no problem. I know that some people see that more and more different. I, I can see also their arguments. Um, we have not been putting... Uh, color codes on, on gloves or stuff like that to see whether they use fresh ones. Um, we try to have people changing them regularly because, I mean, this is a uh, cheap item. It provides security 
protects you yourself and the others. So I think uh, if everyone has an has an easy supply of them, so that's no problem. Um, here around, we did not have. Uh, there was no issue about these these N95 masks, so um, they were practically uh, reserved for for the health professionals, and there is no um, way or no incentive that one would use them in some specific trainings in, in environments or so like that. I think what we see is that um, uh, mouth masks, at least here, is less of a political issue, um, and um, I think. Uh, they, if you can do something to protect people, uh, why wouldn't you? Um, it's also one of the reasons why I'm sitting in this part here of the building and not in my office because um, I'm sharing the office and now talking. Um, I can do now more freely without a mask, but um, I think we, 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 we um, need to be more uh, sensitive and we will need uh, more uh, actions uh, towards protecting our people. And I don't think that we have seen the, the end of that yet. Um, and I think we, we need to judge also based on what is, is most useful and not necessarily whether it's a political issue or not. All right, thank you. Uh, Jennifer, uh, uh, you know, same, kind of, same question, things about what your, your scheduling is gonna look like, operational kind of guidelines going forward. Yeah, so things are quite different now, and I think they will be for, uh, who knows, probably till there's a vaccine. Um, so one thing that hasn't changed is our users have always had to book the microscopes to use them. Um, we also have a sort of real-time tracker where people log on to the instrument with their Harvard credentials, so we keep track of when they logged on and, and, and off as well. So that hasn't changed. Um, what has changed is people used to just pop into the core um, to ask us questions or maybe you know take some data off a computer. That is no longer allowed. Um, the only people who can go into the core are trained users and my team, of course. Um, our room is under key card access. So uh, our security department um, controls card access to the room. Um, so we can control who, who is able to go into the core at all. Um, when users arrive at the core, I'm having them ring our doorbell. Uh, we have a doorbell to the room, which used to be used by people who didn't yet have um, card access, who are maybe coming for a consultation appointment. Um, and that doorbell now alerts people that someone new is coming in. Uh, we debated gloves versus hand washing and finally wound up on hand washing. Um, Harvard is continuing the, the one glove policy. So we thought we should be consistent with that. Um, users are then to disinfect the microscope and to make that as easy as possible for people, we put uh, little brightly colored round stickers on every part that we um, that need to be disinfected. Um, we have a poster with a QR code above the microscope um, so they can get up on their, uh, quickly on their uh, whatever device they have with them, their phone. Um, the videos that I made of actually going through the process of di disinfecting that individual microscope so they can watch that and, and follow it. Um, like Sebastian said, we're particularly worried about the eyepiece and the um, eyepiece tube since people are, you know, getting their eyes close to it and breathing on it. So we are covering that with plastic wrap, having the users cover that with plastic wrap, um, as well as the mouse and keyboard. So, uh, and then they go through the disinfection procedure again. And as I said, I, I presented all of this in a, um, a, a Zoom training session that each user was required to take before they uh, regained access to the core. So yeah, it's quite different now. And I expect in the next phase, probably the only thing that we will lift is that we will continue to do training or we will begin doing trainings again. Um, Harvard, I should say, also is requiring everyone to wear a mask. Um, there are a limited number of entrances to the campus now, and we need to go into one of those entrances and we pick up a mask on the way in. Um, so yeah, we're required to wear a mask everywhere on campus, including, including the core. Great, thank you. Uh, uh, why don't you go next and just kind of elaborate on how you see your operation of your core going forward? Which, sorry, we, you cut out for a sec. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Julia, I'd actually like, I'd like you to go 
next to discuss the lab, discuss going forward. Well, as Sweden is still is an exception, for example, related to the mask, we are not, uh, it's not mandatory in the country. And I would say I practically don't see anyone in the street with mask. That means that actually the moment that we actually decide to use it for the training or for the use of the microscope, especially when we have one person and the staff go there to help that person. I mean, as, as I said before, we limit it to have one person per room and, and ask if we need, if they need our help for five, 10 minutes. Uh, we actually have to ask for permission to, to use this mask to say we need to have a some moment face to face and we need to have this permission that when the vice chancellor delegating the dean of the faculty and the dean uh, allow us, we actually have a paper where we can do that. We have a use in the mask. Uh, that's how it is. And for the gloves, we use immediately once the whole thing, even so as uh, many of my colleagues here, uh, probably we were very much against before with the microscopes, as we say, we don't know uh, what those gloves was before. And we make a mix in between wash the hands and use the oil gloves because, of course, they are not allowed to use the gloves and walk around in the facility, open doors. And uh, if they touch their face, in principle, they need to change. They have gloves, different size that they can use at the, at the, in every room and they can change it. As I say, so far, the facility have not had any problem uh, in the la in the all this month. Obviously, you never know, and maybe the problems will come later. But right now, uh, just by doing that, of course, cleaning, we are the ones, the staff, uh, were clean and keep cleaning the microscopes. We don't let the users to do that job. Uh, we are the ones doing that carefully in the places and change it from some users. We try to also, uh, once we have given some new rules uh, for the facility, to use the facility, one of them is actually that when they book, and we have the online booking, that they always leave around 20 to 30 minutes in between one user and the other one, where first we allow us to clean, but also that they don't find each other uh, and they are crowding it in their corridors, that our corridors are also quite narrow. And then we try to avoid as well uh, the, the number of users that they are walking around to avoid to avoid as well by the booking. Of course, we can also double check who is the person and if the person is there because we see when they when they have when they arrive and logging in the microscope, we actually see who is there and and, and if they actually log or didn't log. And um, for the ones that have been they have have some problems, they call us and say we are not going to come in and we just um, book. Uh, we are very generous in our days. We unbook and we will not charge if they, they really say, oh, I feel bad today. You know what I mean? That will not happen before. But now, obviously, we and that's also part of where the mandate from the faculty as well. I mean, not only from us, but also that we have to be more flexible, more flexible in that. But from the rest, I have to say that we have not used more cleaning and excessively clean with ethanol or with any other, because that will also damage the microscope. So we go constantly to doing that. Uh, we, we have to balance the situation. What we try to do is to, uh, to, keep, to, to train in the users to be very careful in terms of uh, washing hands and, and, and change the gloves, either for the lie or for the electromicroscopes. We also have electromicroscopes or in the lab, preparation lab. In there, we are extremely careful as well. Uh, they are not allowed to wear there without without mask. There, they really need to do. Uh, now that we got, because in the middle of this this pandemic, I have to move my electro microscope unit. <laughs> Believe it or not, it was a challenge, yeah. but it, and we managed to do it. And uh, the, all the microscopes, and now the lab is bigger. We were uh, we have four hoods, and then we we separate them. We don't allow to have four users, mm -hmm. one in each hood. I mean. We have done, uh, it's more to try because in a way, that's why uh, the prime minister and the politicians have told us in Sweden is mainly to keep washing your hands and keep social distance and try to work home and uh, to walk home if you can. And that is where we have. But obviously, as our researchers, they need to come to the bench and they need to come to the microscope. 
And, and then we also the educate the users. Uh, they were quite spoiled and they still spoiled sometimes because our facility have not closed. And when they come and many people and you tell them they cannot do that because they forget and they actually forget these kind of things because we are open constantly. Then I have to say that we have not followed as Jennifer and other restrictions, but I guess it's because the faculty itself, the university and the country doesn't have those restrictions. And then we don't need to follow the restrictions in that so carefully, except that I very much care about my staff. And, and that's why we reduce the number of people and be careful that they actually follow out the rules, the new rules that we have at the facility. Right. Great, thank you. Uh, Josh, I'd like to finish with you. Finish with you, sure. and, uh, you know, given your position. Um, Sort of things like logistics of just obtaining how to regulate you know the usage of these facilities sure um so yeah i mean uh, as i said before you know uh, massachusetts has, has had their sort of timelines and also their guidance and even lab specific guidance and you know uh for us face coverings physical distancing and hand washing those are sort of the cornerstones and those are reflected in our guidance at a university level and obviously with the specific facility um so everybody's got to wear a face covering um and maintain physical distance etc um we the, the the imaging core is asking people to wear gloves um fresh gloves maybe spray them down with ethanol occasionally. Um, we have also the, the eye cups, the coverings for the eyepieces have been removed. Um, th they are trying to get people to wear safety glasses, which obviously Sebastian, as you said, you know, if you've got glasses and just any time, I mean, just looking through uh, eyepieces can be challenging depending, um, but uh, we are trying to do that. The other thing, um, which we're doing um so similarly as 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 uh, jennifer said you know it's not really a walk-in facility you have to sort of pre-book um and one of the things that we're doing is a 30 minute gap between each booking to allow for air circulation and also time to clean and just so that people don't run into each other because if somebody goes goes over if someone shows up early you don't want them bumping into each other um so that gap has been important another thing is um for all researchers for for and and for the for the course staff as well. Um, we have a sort of uh, training module just on um, infection control, COVID specific, that environmental health and safety. And I have to say the director of environmental health and safety has been a really great partner. You know, you asked about sort of more sort of overall the, the, the whole the whole um, program that you know, the director of environmental health and safety has been a, a really great partner. Um, and we also have a director of emergency management and I'm on, you know, some committees with, with them um, that have been looking at you know sort of overall campus stuff research specific stuff course specific stuff and you know they're um, as as jennifer said you know they're providing masks you know and things like that for the researchers which is great um and again um you know just i guess to um uh, uh reiterate something a lot of people have said is this question of in-person training um on microscopes is really the sort of the thing that's you know hanging there that w we're going to need to deal with and i've heard some people at some um some some colleagues uh, at other institutions who've talked about you know n95 masks and face shields and you know this kind of thing maybe to facilitate in-person training um uh, you know i mentioned emulators desktop sharings come up you know this kind of thing but you know there's really no one perfect solution that you know uh, as was mentioned you know until there's a vaccine you know what are we going to do about in-person training? Um, and that is, I think, a big uh, overall question mark. Um, and I guess the last thing that I would say, again, from my point of view, has been um, we've had for the imaging core, um, even some faculty and and other facilities as well, um, delivery and installation of instruments. Um, that's been a, 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 an issue as well because we had uh, a approved purchases um, that were then just sort of paused. And in some cases, we've have have had vendors saying, "When can we drop? When when can we complete? When can we deliver and install?" In other cases, it's been the opposite. You know, the the vendors have said, "Oh, we can't come in. You know, we we can't do that." So that has been one of those things where um, it's just something that I'm constantly monitoring and of course I'm doing this across um, uh, across you know multiple cores and even some faculty labs that I'm involved with with helping that process so that's been one of these things um, that's just been having to keep your eye on it and constantly check in with people um, the, the people expecting them the purchasing and then the the vendors as well 
All right, great. Thank you. So thank you everyone for the I think oh, Jennifer had a yeah. Uh, that's a, that's okay. Just a couple of follow-up things. Um, you know, as Josh said, new equipment is an issue. We have a uh, spinning disc confocal that's been sitting in boxes in my office for months now. Um, and, you know, a, a, in addition to bringing vendors in to install and such, we just don't want to uh, have a microscope down at this point. People have been waiting months to use them. And in order to install the new instrument, we would have to, you know, shut the microscope down for, for a period of time. So we're putting that off for now um, until people have had some time to catch up. And I'll also mention, we, we are also doing the 30 minutes in between sessions. And um, we were talking earlier about companies being helpful. I, I should mention Stratacore, which is the company that makes uh, PPMS, which is the online booking and management software we use, has been really helpful. They have um, put out uh, instructions on how to, and, and added functions to the software to allow for things like a 30 minute block in between force so that when people sign up, it's automatically there. Um, and also methods of making it so that if one microscope is booked, the microscope next door um, mm -hmm. cannot be booked to, again, to um, to allow for social distancing. Oh, that's interesting. Great. Yeah. Uh, I think Julia, you had your hand up. Oh, OK, Julia, please. No, it's just only because we have talked about the staff and the new machines, but actually one of the challenges we have had is to get expert technicians to repair the microscopes. Uh, even so that Sweden is open, the rest of Europe was not. Uh, and we have some problems with the multiphoto microscope that need to have German engineers. And still today, they cannot come. And talking about the moving of the microscopes, uh, we were planning also to move a couple of live microscopes to the new area that we cannot uh, until uh, Germans are allowed to travel. Uh, but because the conditions in Sweden that they are different to the rest of Europe is actually making a problem. Literally, I cannot enter in Norway without to do a quarantine of 14 days just because I'm in Sweden. And then uh, it is something similar for that. Maybe the, the engineer can come here, but maybe when they remember the uh, come back to Germany, they will have to do the quarantine. Whereas this is really the challenge if the machine is actually broken and, and we cannot get a, the expert engineer to actually repair the instrument. Even in Sweden, there is problems. Even AstraZeneca that is here in Gothenburg, they don't allow them to come to our facilities. In, I mean, in the big companies, they are very, uh, even so that they are in Sweden, they are very conservative on that and, and they, they, are, they don't let them to move even in the same city. But the uh, engineers for the microscopes, it has been a challenge and a problem for us. Okay, so at this time, um, I would like to just to thank everyone for a very engaging discussion so far. And it will be now transitioning over to the live Q&A portion uh, with audience input, uh, which will begin in a moment. I'd like to begin the question and answers section for today. Uh, directing the first question to you, Jennifer. Uh, the question is, what kind, can you elaborate on the kinds of hands-on exercises that you are doing in your facility? Yes, sure. Um, so this is part of our educational workshop course program. So, um, yeah, Anna Jost, who I mentioned earlier, and also Riley Walsh, who is a postdoctoral fellow in the core, they've come up with some clever ways to have some interactive part of the workshop so that it's not just you know, lecturing uh, students listening to us. So for example, they've created um, self-grading quizzes that the students can take um, using Google Forms. Um, so, you know, they can go through and test the knowledge of the topics that were covered in the lecture. Um, the myscope.training is a very good website that was developed by a group in Australia, and it's basically microscope simulators. Um, we've, we've had exercises where we provide images that we ask the students to analyze. Um, so an example of that would be for our Confocal workshop, we provide pairs of images in which just one of the acquisition parameters is changed, and then ask the students to compare the image quality by measuring signal-to-noise ratio, background level, or resolution. 
um, for example, so that they could can see what that acquisition parameter um, has changed. And actually, tomorrow, Riley Walsh will be doing a live demo on our uh, Nikon A1R Confocal um, via Zoom. So the plan is for her to be acquiring images and asking the students what she should try next and why they think she should try it. So they'll be able to watch what's happening on the microscope. Great, thank you. Uh, so the next question, uh, actually, I'm going to direct towards Josh. Um, one of the audience members is curious if you could elaborate a little bit more about what your experience has been, and anybody who else who would like to chime in, uh, has been on manuf in terms of the changes with your manufacturing microscope manufacturing companies with regard to the installations, you know, core facility personnel training and equipment maintenance. Sure, um, I definitely happy to talk about that. You, you, everyone, you can hear me, okay? Just want to make sure. Yeah. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think that as a group, um, microscopy core heads uh, generally have very close and good relationships with the manufacturers, um, and so I think that this uh, experience has probably been really uh, supported by that. Um, so, uh, sort of. From beginning to end, uh, communication and uh, you know really reaching out and 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 uh, having sort of as much of a of an open dialogue has been the most important thing, and I think it will continue to be. And this is one of those things where you know they talk about like what are the silver linings or what 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 are the permanent changes uh, going to be, and um, you know exactly just to segue from what what Jennifer was talking about in terms of using WebEx to do like a live demo. I mean. Doing um, remote demos, uh, doing webinars, doing, you know, the, the vendors have really stepped up in terms of um, engaging with the user base, engaging with the, the users and the core heads as well to uh, develop content. And we've had some um, sort of bespoke webinars set up to talk about new instruments or applications or methodologies. Um, and so that has been something where if, you know, I would say to the audience, if you haven't been reaching out to the manufacturers and there are questions you have, there are instruments you're interested in taking a look at, there are um, different, different, you know, things you want to see or learn about, just reach out to them because they have really been incredibly receptive. Um, and then I would say, you know, as I mentioned um, earlier in the, in, the, in, the, in the other portion of, of this was that, you know, we had some issues with, I mean, part of it was due to our end of fiscal year, but we had some issues with, you know, instruments that were on order. We had a few instruments that were, you know, sitting and had been delivered before the shutdown or the ramp down and were sort of sitting in boxes, um, some instruments that we were, you know, wanting to get it delivered and installed. And certainly the guidance of, um, of you know, physical distancing and, and logging uh, anybody from off-site that comes onto the campus and all that kind of stuff, you know, are added wrinkles. But in general, the, um, the, the manufacturers have been really, uh, really helpful and really responsive and, you know, really uh, understanding of A, the limitations, uh, and B, our push to get those things completed and, and installed, of course, with the safety considerations prior, uh, as a priority. Um, and then the only other thing I would, I would mention, which is, you know, um, I think uh, Julia was, was mentioning was about getting people on site to do services, servicing. And I know Jennifer said, you know, she really didn't want any microscopes to go down. And I think that is going to be also a longer term thing because, I mean, in the U.S., interstate travel is still very complicated, not even talking about international travel. And I mean, you know, I've had, I've, uh, in my previous position, you know, I had an instrument where the service, ha um, in, like Ju Julia said, the service ha personnel had to come from Germany. Um, so, there are uh, having, depending where you are, depending what goes wrong, that's going to be a really a, a, a also a longer term consideration as well. Can I just add something? And sure. Julia? Yes, yes, just to follow up where Josh said, I think uh, respect to the online training, we have that experience. Uh, a couple of weeks ago with our electro microscope during four days, even training how to do cryo EM, and I think that's not simple. But the service is going to be 
uh, still a problem if you need to get very specialized and what happens in some facilities like in my and I'm sure it's the same for my other colleagues here that we have uh, uh, state-of-the-art machines or end, uh, uh, high-end machines they unfortunately those type of machines have tendency to break more often or to have some little problems that become big problems some of these problems we also are trying to solve it on the companies try to solve it by remote uh, uh, working that they can enter in our microscopes and look at what happens but unfortunately sometimes they really need to come and that's when uh, we have to wait uh, for uh, maybe get one a technician that tried to repair and if that's not problem not possible we might have to wait for a while until the the expert come and i think that's what will probably be the bottleneck this is where i see the bottleneck and, and just to follow up and reiterate i think that is really going to depend a lot on what type of instrument you're talking about and where you're located because i know that like you know for, for jennifer and i, I mean i'm not going to speak for her but for probably her experience is similar to mine that because we're located in boston where many microscope manufacturers are based in Man massachusetts like that sort of gives us a leg up in terms of getting service i mean i had we had an em issue on monday and the service engineer came in on tuesday so you know that's for sure. I mean, you are completely right. Depends where you are. All right. Thank you. Uh, next question I would like to direct is Sebastian. Uh, somebody that's in the audience is actually in a rather interesting position right now where they have proposed a new core space. Uh, they were originally going for an open plan, uh, you know, one large big room with either cubic, just small cubicles or curtains, but they're now kind of rethinking their strategy. Um, I know you've had to deal with this recently, and so I was curious if you could comment on it, and also if anybody has any thoughts on how cords going forward should be constructed to potentially deal with things like this. Thanks. Uh, I think that the question is, is very much spot on, um, because uh, we see that the landscape is changing, and we see that our needs uh, are changing. We had here, and that's why I comment here on this, the, the, the chance to move into a new space is for us scheduled for next year. That means we practically had uh, the uh, plans made all before uh, any pandemic and so on. Um, we didn't, we moved relatively recently into our current building, so that was 2012, so it's not that long ago. But um, for, for us, um, different than, than what, what Michael here is proposing, we, we have started to plan in more separate rooms. And that came mainly through because we moved into some uh, connected space uh, or some space together with our EM colleagues. And um, we decided then to have uh, extra concrete slabs for, for them as well as for our um, super resolution microscopes. And once you start to have separated concrete slabs, you definitely want to have them in separate rooms. And we also have some separate um, pods where the chillers of the EMs and so on are standing on so that you don't catch that uh, vibrations. Obviously, that's a luxury situation that we're in. And I totally understand that um, uh, that is not possible everywhere. And uh, the situation is charming to say like, well, here's some big connected space and we can optimize it as we go with microscopes that come in. But I think currently um, for for planning now, uh, I think separate rooms are, are way more better, especially if you can plan in separate air conditioning units or even filter units, um, because then one can have all the better the buffer space. Also the, the training that we see now where you connect with people and you may have actually more noise and or more prone to, to background noise it is all favoring a bit more uh, individual rooms where you can separate stuff and also where you can um, simply isolate things where for disinfection and these kind of things. Um, I uh, personally am very happy that we now are with the situation of separate rooms. I would not go back to cubicles, at least in, for, for us. Um, we had planned two bigger rooms, or we had few uh, machines in it, where we actually tend to plan now to put some um, 
quick dry fabric uh, uh, walls in to actually make it more uh, better separated rather than the, the, the curtains. I see not many uh, <coughs> advantages for the curtains other than the flexibility, but I think um, with the situation that we have now, and I believe we will have that for quite a while, uh, I think the, this uh, added value is, is, is rather low. At the same time, it's not practical uh, uh, for, for many uh, places because um, space is, is highly demanded and uh, the universities demand that flexibility. So I have all the understanding that's actually difficult to enforce to have separate rules. That was a long and convoluted answer. I'm sorry for that. But uh, I feel um, having separated parts is good for many reasons. Isolation of vibrations, isolation of people, uh, and and in texture spaces, one can easier design also um, uh, higher security levels for experiments. Uh, I think it all points for me if one has the luxury to do it to a separate space. And I hope that answers that question. Thank you. Um, to actually kind of follow up to that, I actually would be interested to hear from everyone about what your kind of ideal core facility room design would look like. Well, I, I will be agree with uh, um, Sebastian, and I will add it as well. We have different rooms. Uh, we have separate rooms. And the circulation, I think one of the questions as well from one of the audience it was about the circulation, how, how we actually have decided 30 minutes in between one user and the other is because we have a change, a renovation, a full renovation of air every 15 minutes in each room. That means that if I have 30 minutes in between users, there have been a renovation twice of the air in that room before the next, the next user can. That means I feel quite confident that in terms of the air, <laughs> Uh, they, they are inside that room. It is a, a relatively small room, and it's not just only the air condition of the of uh, that we have, also air conditions or cool, uh, sun cold uh, conditions. We also have a renovation of air every 15 minutes, and that's much simple. If you have uh, sing, simple room, single rooms, that if you have, or if you have a problem with the circulation in one room, they will not affect the second room because they are separate. Definitely. I will vote always, as, but of course, as Sebastian said, sometimes it always depends the amount of money the institute or the university have or the faculty have for constructing a new facility. So can I jump in here? This is Josh. Um, so I'm, I'm not trying to be a contrarian, but I do want to say that um, so from my position uh, overseeing a wide variety of cores, which range from cores where the, 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 the core staff run samples for people to, um, you know, 24-7 user access facilities and everything in between, um, I have to say that there are some benefits to the open plan, I would say, or, or some limitations to the individual rooms model. Um, I mean, my experience running a microscope core was that, you know, rooms that had one microscope in them sometimes you would be crunch for space and those would quickly become rooms for two microscopes. And when you have a small room that has more than one microscope, then that becomes a pain. And one of the things that has been happening in some places with some colleagues I know is they've had to create, you know, uh, mutually exclusive calendars so that, you know, you, you could use microscope A in this room or microscope B in this room, but not the two at the same time. Um, and that can evolve and having really one dedicated room per microscope in perpetuity um, might not be the best use of space ultimately um, in, uh, you know, in, in, in a perfect world. Um, for, furthermore, I would say that by having a sort of open plan facility, it's easier to, I don't want to say police, but it's easier to monitor, it's easier to support um, proper uh, procedures and the institute the new SOPs and make sure that people are doing the right thing and not doing the wrong thing. And also, uh, we talked a bit about this half hour break. So by having one room, uh, you could basically shut down the whole room for half an hour and the, the staff of the core can make sure that everything is properly cleaned and then reopen it. Now that does create a scheduling uh, complexity, certainly. Um, but it is an alternative that we have instituted in at least one of our facilities um, where, where I am. Uh, Josh, there are no objections to, to, to what you say from, from my point of view. I think the, the question is how you can design it uh, optimally and 
how you, how you can decide also future proof. Um, and I think a lot of the, the, the problems you're pointing out is, um, do you have a planned in enough leeway for, for future microscopes to come? Because at the moment, uh, we see that they mostly uh, increase. Um, I think the, the question there is, is more of how to handle and how to eventually also decommission and, and uh, handle the, the, the growth of them um, rather than a, a direct space uh, relation uh, question. But anyhow, um, there's different ways to do it. Uh, I still think in, in the ideal world scenario, uh, I, I still prefer to have them separate. I also prefer that I don't have to police the people and that they all abide the rules uh, anyway. But um, <laughs> I totally admit uh, we both talk about some uh, uh, ideal world scenarios which um, have downsides in, in reality in, in both directions. And yes, having multiple microscopes in small rooms is definitely not the situation you want to end up in. I'll just add one more very quick comment, and that is mm -hmm. that, um, you know, I can argue either small rooms, large rooms, there's benefits to both. But I think if you are trying to uh, design a core facility right now, and you are considering the possibility of airborne disease, the most important thing is what Julia brought up, which is what is the air turnover for that space? Yeah. And that is something you should be able to find out from your facilities or the engineers who designed the building. Uh, I, 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 absolutely correct, Jennifer. I think you're spot on. I think also recently someone proposed that uh, HEPA filters um, are, are likely more to come and more connected to, to more uh, air conditioning units and likely also in our professional environment. I think we will actually see that uh, going to happen. And, and that obviously is in separate spaces a bit better. Uh, sorry, uh, Julia, for interrupting. No, it's, 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 it's OK. No, it's yes, I agree with Jennifer. But of course, we are now discussing uh, microscopy facilities. But if we're talking about proteomics or other facilities where there is not always users sitting around the microscope, it might be okay. And, and I think it's working fine. And this is how they have uh, their mass spectrometers in, in more machines in one room. So, I mean, it depends exact. It depends a little bit what type of facility. If it's a microscopy facility where you have to have one or sometimes two people, when you have the operator and the, or the trainer and the trainee, uh, definitely I like the possibility to have separate rooms instead to be in a, we, we have a cases where we have two microscopes in a small room or relatively small room. We thought there was a big room and we have two microscopes. And, and then the, the situation was very crowded. That means that we're lucky now that we actually move one of these microscopes during this time of the pandemic. Uh, and, and there was only one because not that we could have, have a problem in that, in that uh, room for training or for just working. Great. So actually turning a little bit towards training, uh, Julie, I'd like to start with you. Um, could you just kind of reiterate, reiterate a bit um, how you anticipate starting training new users in your facility? Okay, thank you very much. Yes, uh, we, we of course, as I said during the during the interview, uh, we have users coming all 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 this time, but the training face to face was a limitation. I was a problem because it's not possible to keep the social distance if we are in the rooms, even if we are in a relatively big room. We have to go be in front of the microscope. That means that we have to take another option, and we are doing something in between. We normally do. Uh, our Full training is around six hours, three day, three hours one day, three hours another day. Maybe it can be a bit more, but can be a bit less. Depends of the person if they have some experience or have zero experience. And um, we decide to do part of this training by remote. Uh, we are lucky here in, in the University of Gothenburg that we have the Microsoft Teams, uh, the full package, the full program that we can use and put in our microscope co computers and also help our users. And we do the first training by remote, totally by remote. And the user, uh, we, we send the users some instructions and recommendations uh, to use uh, headsets and to check that have a good screen 
and especially if they could have a big screen, that would be ideal. We also test him before the training, uh, the day before the training, if everything were fine in terms of uh, that they hearing us uh, correctly. And um, we have to say, as I say as well during the interview, that we have been, uh, of course, we were hesitant and we were a bit, uh, as we need to have, especially for the beginners, but also for the experience, we have to also have a face-to-face -face or a training that is hang on directly at the microscope. And we have to do that. But uh, we were very surprised, happily surprised, that the, the first training where we do is we training for a couple of hours or three hours. They have been, we record the full remote session. And we send that remote session to the user. That means that the user can look it again um, before. And we put around two or three days in between the training, the, the first training and the second one, where we will have a, a hang-on, so face-to-face -face training. But during that face-to-face -face training, of course, we, we were in masks uh, during the training. And, uh, we also uh, noticed that they actually, even the beginners, that that was the ones we were a bit more concerned because, of course, uh, sometimes some of them have not really worked with a confocal microscope before. Uh, they were actually quite, um, they followed very well the second session and to try to actually minimize the time that the, the staff uh, is training, the trainer is at the microscope and with the user in the hang-ons, we continue to have, have the, we, we advise them to bring their headsets that we connected to the microscope computer and we can follow them by, because we can see by, uh, as well by the Microsoft Teams in our own computers in the office, we can follow them. Uh, and then we can uh, we can come back to our office, let them to try to work with their samples. We can go back and forth, just minimize as much as possible the time that the staff is with the user. And uh, surprisingly, as I say, happily surprised, it has worked very well. We have done several uh, trainings in that way for people that they are also beginners, not only training, not only experienced users. Uh, especially most of them are beginners. We have done it even with a multi-photo microscope that is more challenging when you have to use a special uh, laser. But uh, so far, our experience, it's really, really positive. Uh, um, the user, because they are more focused and they have the possibility to look at again because we give them the recorded session. I think that have been really harmful and very, very good for the user uh, to have an extra training that you don't have that when are you actually sitting, uh, sitting at the microscope. As well, we create a good, quite good uh, tutorials uh, on with basis on microscopy that we that we show them in case that they need to be training as well or they understand more as we do on the face to face. And in our experience, I have to say, uh, we are really actually thinking about to for the future because this situation is probably going to end for quite long, as uh, Sebastian and my other colleagues said. I think we are going to continue the, the training on um, mixing remote and face-to-face -face training uh, during a long time and maybe will be the way that we are going to, to work. At least that's in our experience so far. And we have two or three trainings ongoing right now, and my staff are actually quite happy of, of the output of this training. All right, great, thank you. So either, uh, actually, there's multiple people who might be interested in answering this. Uh, so Jennifer and Josh, uh, I'm gonna direct this towards you both. Um, there is a question actually kind of discussing the problems with keeping microscope, microscopes down uh, and then restarting them after a long time of being uh, out of use and off, off, and you know, what kind of steps would you recommend for reopening a facility for re things like doing realignments of microscopes? You know, because these are sensitive, uh, sensitive equipments. Sure, I I think it certainly depends on the microscope that we're talking about. Um, I think if a system is laser-based, you may need to align the laser launch. Um, those can certainly drift over time. 
Um, what we did is after we started everything up, we just did our regular maintenance checks. So we, we do, um, you know, sort of quality control tests on the microscopes routinely, and we did those in order to identify any potential problems. And, you know, for something like the laser launch, that's just measuring the intensity out of the objective lens, and if that hasn't changed, then we can be confident it doesn't need work. Uh, we generally do those sorts of alignment ourselves, but if that's not something that uh, folks are comfortable with, then if if you do find it out of alignment, you may need to ask one of the companies to come in and take a look at it. Josh, you have so, um, yeah, so I mean, I think Jennifer is totally right, and it depends on which type of system you're talking about. Um, I mean, one issue, uh, for example, with uh, electron microscopes, um, you know, can be if they if there's a vacuum uh, loss. And you know you can actually have catastrophic catastrophic failures. You know, so for one of the real concerns we had, because um, not all all of our EMs, you know, are on you know uh, full backup generators, and a, a, a UP, UPS will eventually you know die. Um, is you know if you had a power failure in, in and you were and everyone was working from home and offsite. So uh, there are uh, systems where you you can install um, power monitors and and we've done that uh, in some cases. Um, multi photons are another one where you know you kind of want to okay you know they're 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 like you know your car you kind of want to run them occasionally. Um, so uh, it depends on the system. It depends on what the concern is. And again, like going back to the first question that was addressed to me, um, you know, communicating uh, with the manufacturers is, is key. And, you know, this is an unprecedented situation. And, you know, it may be that nobody used a microscope for a period of time just because no one wanted to use it. But it wasn't, you know, three, three or four months of, of, of having the facility basically shut down or whatever, which could certainly in some cases happen again in some locations, um, is kind of unprecedented. So I think uh, just constant communication and monitoring and, you know, there's definitely, a, you know, when we were in a mode of, of no, basically, you know, the, when the facilities were still sh were shut down, we could still, uh, you could, there was like the essential workers could go in and they could, you know, um, check things and, and, you know, that was part of the overall uh, response planning, um, continuity planning uh, piece, so. Can I just jump in with one more comment? Um, the microscope manufacturers have been really helpful in this. They have all, uh, there were a couple of questions coming up about like what sort of disinfectants to use mm -hmm. and they have released instructions on what types of disinfectants are both effective and um, won't damage the equipment. So I think when, when these equipment questions come up, you should feel free to reach out to the manufacturers because they have certainly been thinking about these issues as well. Uh, can, can yeah, I, and can absolutely. I, and, sorry, I was just going to say, you might not, you know, don't expect that the first person you talk to will necessarily have the, have the answer for you immediately, you know, but eventually the, the, the right people will respond and give you a really solid answer. I think Sebastian had a comment. Yeah, yeah, no, we, we, had, we had some great uh, incidents here. Um, and then what, what I just learned from that is that we don't have real proper stress tests for, for these kind of situations. What happened is that uh, because of the lockdown, a water bath in a neighboring lab dried out and uh, caught the short circuit, which blew the fuse and, and uh, ripped some of the electricity along the line apart and affected both uh, a number of incubators and, and uh, one of our microscopy rooms where we had uh, our sim in. And um, getting that back to life, we could come in as essential workers, uh, w was tremendously hard because since there's no one else around, um, actually getting to the, the fuse box and then checking what's wrong uh, was really uh, tricky and getting it back to life. It turned out at the end that uh, the stand of the microscope uh, got uh, somewhat damaged and we had to replace it. Um, I think uh, also coming back to the comment where we had the discussion on how do we plan uh, spaces for, for facilities, um, I think we're literally uh, in the buildings uh, not at all prepared and have not planned very well for how to deal with these scenarios. Obviously, uh, the drying out of the water bath is something that would not happen uh, if there wouldn't have been a pandemic. And um, uh, we wouldn't have thought of that ever 
um, as a problem for us because it would have it's from a neighboring uh, lab. But it taught me that I mean this is really the unprecedented things, and if uh, the, the personal connections with the companies here were super essentially to solve that problem for for now. At the same time, I think we need to prepare better. Uh, that's what I learned for myself to to have you know all kind of worst case scenarios and and see who we would connect uh, for getting the electricity back in our uh, case here. Um, that's what I'm sort of quickly connecting on that. Thank you very much, uh, Sebastian. That's actually a really good uh, parting comment. So unfortunately, we've actually reached the end of our time today for questions. I would like to thank all of our panelists for taking the time to join us today. This is Dr. Josh Rappaport from Boston College, Dr. Julia Fernandez Rodriguez of the University of Gothenburg in Sweden, Dr. Jennifer Waters of Harvard Medical School, and Dr. Sebastian Monk from KU Levin in Belgium. Uh, this has been a great discussion about the problems that uh, these core facilities are facing and things that you can do to mitigate them. Any questions that were not answered uh, during this question and answer period will be addressed by email when possible. I would like to thank Nikon Instruments for sponsoring this panel discussion today in collaboration with Wiley's Current Protocols. There will be an on-demand recording of this panel discussion available at www.currentprotocols.com under the Resources tab in the webinar section. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today, and have a good day. Thank you.